Come on. It's right here. Up, up, up. Oh, hey. kind of old, aren't you? But he's still with it. He's still with it. Huh? Still with it? Kind of. <laughs> I'm not going to put my hand in this tank. <laughs> Sometimes they'll flare at me. <laughs> it's kind of chubby. Mm hmm. You gonna flare at me? Yeah. Look at you. Kind of old, huh? But you're still good looking. Oh, flare, 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 flare. Flare, 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 flare. Oh man, you're such a cool fish. Look at that tail. <laughs> Look at that tail. Good looking. Trying to get my reflection out of it. <laughs> Buddy, here. Come on. Up. Come on. It's right here. Up, up, up. Okay. Oh, oh, the thing is going up and down. So what before was a video, this is me talking now. That was a video I recorded like a year ago. Yes! Okay, so first, I've been spoiling him a lot because he is now unfortunately an only child. But here's Waldo. Oh, oh no. Here's Weldon. Here's Weldon. Oh god. That... Okay. Here's Weldon. So you can see he got a little beat up on his nose because he was probably like not happy where he was in the boarding facility. But he's going to help. Yes, Brayden's Vettas. That was my old blue Galaris and he wants to jump onto the screen <laughs> and be with you guys. So that was my old blue Galaris, and I am super, super excited. Hold on, he keeps typing. I am super, super excited to be hatching them again. Oh, Waldo. So my female bearded dragon, I said this last night. Um, long story short, she died at the boarding facility while I was in the Philippines, so... That was really rough. She had a pre-existing medical condition and the stress of being somewhere, she was a very nervous dragon, unlike him. The stress of being somewhere new probably um, exacerbated it, made her worse, and then she died Christmas Day. So um, anyway, Connor, yes, and I think you asked that on one of my, um, one of my other videos. Uh, if we have time, I. At the end, I can like run over and um, take a look at their tanks because I haven't taken Waldo's tank down yet. But um, yeah, so Weldon's just sitting here. He's going to help. He likes helping in the fish room. It's okay. He's, she was a great dragon. She was my first dragon. I got Weldon later. And she kind of taught me that reptiles can be awesome pets. So um yeah, she's, uh, I miss her, but it's getting better. It's getting better. She was, she wasn't that old. She was like six years old and I rescued her. So that was part of the problem, right? 
for the first year of her life, she didn't get enough calcium, she wasn't handled at all, things like that. So rescuing animals is awesome because they have this wonderful home, right? But then a lot of those things that they don't get when they're young, um, it can really do permanent damage to their body. And I think that's what happened to her. Uh, ooh, Flynn's fish for him. I am a VETA judge. And um, here, let me show you. One second. So here is my... Oh, where did the chat go? I think Weldon's pressing buttons. Okay, so here is my judging certificate. So, you know, I'm legit, right? <laughs> this is the standard. So you can see there are, how many classes are there for the 2016-2017 show year? There are 51 different classes. And then so here are all of the, th oh wait, here we go. Here are all of the standards, right? So we have some pictures. We basically judge on a least fault system. You can see all these things. Uh, basically, you go from like minor to severe. We also do wild bettas occasionally in the shows. You just basically judge them on condition and health. But like, for example, for the, let's pick a quote unquote easy one. So for reds, red, here you go. For red, um, let's see. Color faults for red bettas. A slight fault is white ventrals. Uh, black scales are minor faults. So it goes from slight, minor, major, so that's the presence of yellow or orange, to severe, which in this case is like the presence of blue. So this is... This is the, this, when you ask what we look for, we basically look for a strong body, like really nice fins, things like that. But man, this, you want to break it down, you want to break it down, okay? So I, I can do a video on that. I feel like that's more of a niche thing, but um, I can definitely do that. Weldon is totally pressing buttons. Uh, hopefully he doesn't turn this off. I'm going to put him down. He likes sitting on keyboards like a cat because they're warm. Okie dokie. Uh, so the program for today was um, originally I wanted to hatch some killifish eggs with you because I have a bunch of eggs that I need to hatch this weekend. But one rule is that you need to have live food whenever you hatch killifish eggs because they are ravenous. They are starving as soon as they leave the egg. They're not like arowanas that have a giant yolk sac on them, um, um, you know, and then they can persist and live off of the yolk sac for a while. But um, killifish, they don't have a yolk sac whenever they leave the egg. They need to eat right away. And someone, a.k.a. me, forgot to put... Um, baby brine shrimp in my brine shrimp hatchery yesterday because I, um, the time change was awful. We ended up going to bed at like, my boyfriend slept until 3 p.m., went to bed, got up for a little bit, slept at 9 p.m. I tried to sleep at 9 p.m. My throat hurt really, really bad. So then I stayed up till 3 a.m. and it just, it was terrible. Um, let's see. Oh, got some stuff. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, daddies. I like my fish room too. Okay. Uh, Sebastian, um, yeah, sure. I can try and get you some pygmy sunfish um, and killifish. Best would be if you go to the San Francisco Bay Area Aquarium Society. Uh, we're going to have a meeting in January sometime. It might be at my apartment. Probably not, though. I don't know how many people are here. It's kind of hot potato who wants to hold it at their house. <laughs> but you should go to that. We have awesome auctions, and you always come away with too many fish. Um Let's see. Br brown when is, I'm sorry if I say it wrong. Brown whenism. I was a rabbit judge and a self-colored uh, black would get disqualified if it had white air, hairs or toenails. Yeah, they're very, very strict on the color. That's cool. One of the guys in our um, California Betta Society Club was also a rabbit guy before. Okay, B 
brief Brayden's bed is, oh no, where'd it go? I can see what people say when the chat just goes insane. Brayden Svetas, can you, oh, I loved your interview, by the way. That was awesome with Corey. Uh, anyway, can you give a quick rundown on the setup of a Blue Galeris? So the Blue Galeris I had before, he was a Niger Delta male. He got to be about this big. He was like, I don't know, six, seven inches from nose to tail. Um, I had him by himself in a 20 gallon. And it was just like, it was a really cool tank if you go back to my um, old videos because it had this, so where these pothos plants came from, these tiny weeny little things, they came from a plant where the leaves were this big. Like they were enormous. It was going crazy and it was climbing up my window. Um, and so he had tons of roots that's where the plant was tons of roots and driftwood and he liked it in there um I want to try Lucas's method and keep him with other fish and with each other because he says they're peaceful but when I tried to keep my blue galeris with um uh what did I try in there I tried um quarry cats I forget which ones um I picked them because they liked cooler water. I cannot remember. They were really neat looking. Oh, salt and pepper quarries. So I had three salt and pepper quarries in there. And then I woke up one day and he had killed them all. I am pretty sure he killed them because they were all dead. And he was shaking one of them by the tail. <laughs> so um, he lived a solitary life after that. But um, maybe it's like bettas once you... Um, make them solitary maybe it makes them really aggressive when you try to put them back together I don't know so this time I'm going to keep them all together um, and so my plan because I will be hatching out Shostadai or the Galeris eggs that I got in the mail I did an unboxing video of that uh, they need to be hatched this weekend I am going to um, hatch them oh I'm, behind, I'm in front of it I'm going to fill this up a little bit, hatch them in there, grow them out, slowly fill it up, kind of like bettas. And then I have this 30 gallon tank. And um, the 20 gallon up there, I might also use. I might move out my betta palafina. So, but killifish, simple room temperature. Um, they like plants and driftwood, they don't require like special. Um, water requirements like these licorice gouramis that are a pain in the butt up there they're just super simple fish uh yeah hopefully braided i hope that works like when i was talking to other killifish keepers when i was just you know i had my pet blue galeris for a long time and then uh, i wanted to start breeding them they were like oh you need like there's this dude apparently that had a male in a bathtub like and these blue galeris have the capability to get enormous. And I'm like, oh, I don't want them that large. <laughs> like, all my fish are small and colorful. <laughs> so, um, but I want them to grow well. So I'm going to try a 30-gallon, the 10-gallon, and maybe the 20-gallon. And um, I think I'm running out of room in this room already, which is sad. Okay, hopefully that helps. But then I've also heard that you can breed them in a five gallon. So I think it, it's kind of like bettas. It works out for everybody else. Let's see. Best beginner killifish? Definitely gardener eye. Definitely, definitely gardener eye. Um, they're like the guppies of the fish world. And I just like them because they're bold and really colorful. I'm just checking where Weldon is. Uh, oh, Sebastian, go to the Facebook page. So just type in San Francisco Bay Area Killifish Association um, and then go to their Facebook page and that's where we post all of our events. We have not decided on the January meeting time and place yet. Uh, I don't know of anyone that sh uh, in Canada that ships bettas. I knew one a while ago. There is a new International Betta Congress chapter. <laughs> well, it's trying to climb up. He's being silly. Um, um, I said I would look at that, didn't I? I'll look again. <laughs> uh, Professor M, are the killifry too big for paramecium? Yes, the, um, 
the Gardner Eye, the Blue Galeris, and I was going to try Nathalibius um, today. I was, until I didn't have any baby brine shrimp. They are pretty large. Like, they're not like the Lassoma fry or the Pygmy Sunfish fry, which are absolutely minuscule, right? Um, they're way bigger than Betta fry. They're bigger... I would... Yeah, they're larger than Heterandria Formosa fry when they come out. Like, they are big fry. They could potentially go for the tiny, tiny Grindle worms, but I really don't want to risk it today. So I'm just going to wait till tomorrow. Oh yeah, I don't have micro worms. I don't know why I can't grow micro worms. I just, I can't. <laughs> I forget about them. And then it turns into this awful sludge. Um, but I'm wonderful with Grindle worms and white worms, so. Uh, oh, jeez. Uh, oh boy. Go, okay. So, yes. Rick Phillips, that's why I'm going to wait. Um, because I don't have anything the correct size, I don't think. Connor Winfield, so what I'm going to do today, so maybe I'll stop a asking qu or answering questions right now. What I'm going to do today is I wanted to do this as a live stream, one, to like share this special moment with you, and two, to go over how I do it. Because I don't have the BBS, I am basically going to show all of you how to do it without actually doing it. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's see. Number one, you need live food. I am going to stop answering questions not related to, directly related to hatching the fish. So you can ask questions while I'm doing this demonstration and I will try to like watch them and uh, answer them as they come. And I'll pause occasionally for questions for each part. So um, is everyone clear on that? That's how we're going to try it. This is the first time I've tried this thing too. Um, let's see. I'm going to scroll down because like I'm super lost now. Okay. That makes sense? Yep. Okay. We're all into it. So first thing, you need appropriate sized food. <laughs> so uh, I have tons of paramecium. Uh, but I don't have microworms. I should get microworms. This will be like the tenth time I've tried growing them again. So I could, you could try grindle worms and separating them out so that the smallest worms are on the outside. But again, I want to um, do it right. And I know baby brine shrimp works. So here's my baby brine shrimp hatchery. It's on now. It was not on last night when it should have been. So anyway, you want food. Um, second thing, you need eggs. <laughs> so, um, oh wait, hold on. I feed baby brine shrimp to all newly hatched killies. Yes, Charlie, awesome. I'm glad that it works for you. It seems like uh, that's a pretty common size is to be able to eat the baby brine shrimp. Um, 007 Clanger, that's a pretty awesome username. Are the newly hatched okay with deep water or do they need shallow? Good question. So um, I will talk a little bit about that um, when I get to the actual hatching part. So um, what do you feed the brine shrimp? Uh, I hatch them as normal. So I have like this 10 minute hatching routine um, that you can look up the video. So you really want them to be as newly hatched as possible so that they still have the yolk sac and are still nutritious and are still small enough to be eaten by the fry. So you actually don't feed them anything. You really don't want them to be eating anything. You want them to still be on their yolk sac. <coughs> yes, Lucas, I really want to get that stuff. You keep pushing it. <laughs> Maybe I'll write an email too. <laughs> so, um... Where do you get it, by the way? Do you just get it on Amazon, online somewhere? I want to do that. So I've never worked with Cyclops, um, Flynn. I, I, I'm such a, I just stick to Grindle worms so much. I don't <laughs> haven't tried that. So sorry, my nose is, I think I'm still sick. OK, um, let's see. Yeah, so Lucas, definitely, where do you get that stuff? I get them on pellet food pretty fast, but I definitely don't start with it. 
Amazon has it. Ooh, Gemco. I love Gemco. So Lucas is saying Petco has it, Amazon has it, Gemco has it. So um, I have a funny story about Gemco. I don't think they like me, but I we can talk about that later. Um, let's see. Daphnia. Oh my gosh, Professor M. I suck at Daphnia too. I'm like a horrible live food fish keeper. <laughs> I tried to like do the five gallon bucket on the fire escape thing and that didn't work. Um, yeah, I, every time I go to a fish meeting, I just pick up Daphne and feed it right away. I tried, um, I, I don't have tank space for them. So, um, let's see, like to look them up, but look for the 90% hatch rates. Yeah. Uh, get the highest quality baby brine shrimp, you, uh, eggs you can. So, e so for pets, I just have. I just have Weldon now for my bearded dragon. And um, I'm thinking of getting class pets for my future students. But him and fish, that's all. Just him. Okay. So what was I going to do? You need eggs. Okay. <laughs> so this is my egg drawer. So you can see it is a regular drawer. And if we go to, if we use my heat gun, we can check what temperature it is. Obviously it fluctuates because it's at room temperature. So it is at 69.6, .6, usually around 70 degrees. And it goes up and down 68 to 72. So um, that's where I keep my eggs. When I collect eggs, I have them see if I can use this light. This room doesn't get a ton of natural light. Okay, so I collect them on this. I keep everything on peat. It's just what's worked for me so far. I want to try like permanent setups where the um, killifish just live with their young, but it seems like I have a ton of um, fry eaters. I don't know why, but um, I just really like even though these are technically plant and mop spawners, I like to pick the eggs and put them on peat. So um, that's what this is. This is called the vaporization method, I guess. Um, and you know, I tried getting killifish to work for like two years before I actually got them to work like gangbusters. So this works for me. I would love to hear from Lucas, like all of his experiences with it. If I can get on the live stream tonight, maybe I can ask you, but um, probably not likely. I have so much work to do. Sorry, side note. Um, let's see. Charlie Moorhead, Hikari first bites. Yeah, the reason that I don't use um, like non-live food, I'm not used to it, is because betta fry are so picky. Like. You know, I tried the egg yolk method that the Thai use and that kind of stuff, but I'm convinced like the egg yolk method just increases the infusoria in the water. And I try to do that as much as possible. I add some like half, uh, half broken down Indian almond leaf and tons of java moss and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, they just don't like pelleted stuff for me anyway, but that's just me. <laughs> So Rick Phillips has more to Gardner I in a deer. Oh, I used to have that one. Um, and I can't pronounce that. On microworms, BBS, crushed tetragranules. Awesome. Yeah, there's a ton of different ways. It's all about how you do it. All about how you do it. Oh, Flynn, you get um, the heat gun on Amazon. I got it like for 10 bucks. It was on sale. I think it was on Prime Day. <laughs> Okay, so this is, again, the way I like to do it. And I'll show you why I like to do it. It's because here, if we move over to this tank, they're a little scared of me because I was, like, banging around in here earlier. Oh. But, um, like, that's about half the fry that are showing. Can you see all those guys? So I like it because I can hatch them all at the same time. They're all the same age, same size. 
the older ones don't eat the younger ones. Ah, oh, cute. There's a little male that's starting to flare at his companions. Anyway, I think I got like 40, 50 fry in there. And I just like raising them all together at the same time. So that's why I like to do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, I tried the first seven spawns with bettas I did. I tried not using baby brine shrimp and it I got one to survive. I named her Survivor. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Uh, let's see. So look at pick the eggs out and put it on a peat. Another reason why I like it is um, I did water incubate once and it kind of worked. But um, I like it because when the eggs are on peat, the fungus, if one of them is infertile and funguses, then it won't move around. Like you can go in and pick out that single egg that has turned cottony. And here I have a picture of it. Well, that is ridiculous. Apparently when I go to a picture, it doesn't draw from my audio anymore. That is silly. Oh wait, maybe I can do it. Let me try again. I think I got it. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. I think I got it. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I'm waiting for someone. Okay, thanks Southern Fish Keeper. All right, so the egg on the left, okay, is um, a fungus egg. So it looks like a cotton ball, right? And that's why I like growing on peat because that infection, that, that infected fungusy egg won't spread it to the other eggs. If it was in water, it would move through the water and get to all the other eggs. But because it's on peat, you literally put them on the surface of the peat. It stays localized to that one infected egg, and then you can go in and pick it out, and it won't infect the other eggs. The egg in the middle is a, um, a clear egg that's fertile. They're kind of clear when they're first laid. They're soft for the first hour or so. Um, um, but a fertile egg that's hardened off after about like um, um, an hour, when you pick it off the mop, uh, it's hard. It feels like a pebble. And actually, you shouldn't be scared to handle it. You just use your fingers. And then this picture are eyed up eggs. And that's the stage that all your eggs should be at or most of them should be at before you water them uh, or wet them rather is the term. And they are bizarre looking. They have these huge eyes. And as you can see, you can see the pigmentation of their spine. And they're light sensitive. So if you look in there with a flashlight, they all start wiggling at you, like turning inside the egg. So that's pretty bizarre. Um, I tried earlier to see if my computer camera could pick up the, um, the eyed up eggs that I have, but it can't. So here's a picture here. <laughs> So, um, let's see, anyone have questions related to what I just talked about? Okay, okay, Mr. Super 101, really quickly, um, when I was in Europe judging a show in Germany, there was one um, club there 
that had U.S. native fish. It was cool. They had rainbow shiners and pygmy sunfish, but I don't know how you could get them in Europe, um, unfortunately. Okay, does core work the same? Uh, Sebastian, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. So core has the same, has or has really similar properties concerning like water absorption and holding and that kind of stuff. However, I'm terrified of, um, I, I'm not terrified. I am wary of using core because the, um, the mineral content is so much higher. And I know this because I killed some of my carnivorous plants thinking that I could use the core that I had, um, which I use, which is just fine for Grindel and whiteworm cultures. Um, I thought, hey, it's similar, right? I should be able to use it with my carnivorous plants. They died a horrible death because carnivorous plants cannot tolerate that really high mineral content. If we think back to like TDS, total dissolved solids, so it is skyrocket hard, skyrocket hard. Uh, peat moss, on the other hand, is acidic and it doesn't have that. So um, you can try it. Maybe I'll try it too. We should experiment. Um, but I use peat moss because that's what all the killie guys use. Um, the peat moss, I got them, uh, Tamara, yes, I got mine at the garden center as well. And um, it's funny, one of the guys in the killie fish club, he grows orchids too. And he says that the best place to get the highest ingredients or the highest quality ingredients um, for anything like that is um, the pot stores. <laughs> Go to like the indoor hydroponics stores, the pot stores. We have tons of them around San Francisco, right? <laughs> so go to the pot stores. They will have the highest quality like New Zealand sphagnum moss if you're growing orchids or carnivorous plants, like super high grade fine peat moss. Um, so go to a pot store. Yeah, I'm never going to tell my students that. Um Okay, let's see. So Mr. Super 101 brought private breeding groups from old private imports. Yeah, I think that would be a good way to go. <laughs> Sebastian, aquariums and hydroponics, like that, woo, that's awesome. I feel like, oh, I'm going on a tangent, but you know, not that I use it or anything, but you know, I feel like aquariums and that particular activity just grow go really well together just saying there's a certain perspective that one gets and then you just kind of want to sit and watch something like that like nothing like crazy like Fantasia just watch like a mesmerizing community tank I don't know that's enough I'm not going to continue along that vein but <laughs> okay so um, the eggs, where do you get the eggs? So hopefully there are eggs in here. So I set it up. Oh, uh oh, how do I turn this off? Okay, phew, that was weird. Okay, so over here. All right, so I don't, um, so, yeah, they definitely go hand in hand. Okay, so, so, oh, you can still see the picture. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is, I really got to get used to this wire cast thing. Okay, so I have rolled over. So here are some baby gardener eye here. Um, so I only have a pair of Ephiosimian or Chromaphiosimian. Ah. Vivitatum in here. Um, they have not been touched since before I went to the Philippines. So do you think there will be eggs there or not? It's kind of difficult. So I found that um, killifish lay eggs best whenever um, you've separated the male and the female and then you put them together in like really clean water conditions with a new mop. They just go crazy. Like I've had like a pair of gardener eye in one day lay 30 eggs. They just get super excited. 
<laughs> when they haven't seen another fish for a while. You know, it's understandable. Um, <laughs> so these guys, have this pair has been living together for a while. Um, I want to really get them... Um, I've been told that these guys can colony breed, so that's what I really want to do. I have two big spawn mops in there and a ton of guppy grass that I hope really fills in. Um, they're also super aggressive, so I used to have three females to this male, and I don't know who killed the other two females, but they were, um, yeah, they got ripped up at some night. I don't know who did it or why. Because um, I saw no other like parasites and all the water was fine, so I have no idea. Um, and you can see all of my tanks are plastic wrapped like crazy. Oh, the female's up here. She likes to beg for food. I don't know. She's like that brown dot right there. Um, anyway, who knows uh, where they went. I also check inside the filter. I had a fish get stuck inside one of my sponge filters for a month. She came out, her spine was bent. I didn't know where she went. I thought she jumped out of the tank. <laughs> but um, yeah, she came out and couldn't really swim for two weeks and then she recovered fully. So they're pretty crazy fish. Sorry, I keep going on tangents. Okay, so um, we will see how many eggs are in here. So um, again, the highest egg production will be when you've separated the male and the female. Hold up, Weldon! The highest egg production will be when you've separated out the male and the female and you put them together. The, um, the problem with having the mops in here for a while, I don't know, is that they um, eat the eggs. So, but we'll see if there are any in here, so. He will then. Sometimes he gets in the back behind my fish tanks and then it's really hard to get him out. Okay, so let's see if there are any eggs in here. Sorry, lady. Gotta move. We'll just see. I don't have high hopes because this mop has been in here for a while. Okay, so first thing. I'm going to squeeze it really hard. Not really hard. Not super hard. Well, since they're here, um, he's like, what are you doing? Okay, so I'm going to squeeze it like that, okay? Not hard enough to like super pop all your eggs, but the eggs can actually stand quite a bit of pressure. Think of like an egg, like a, you know, a chicken egg and how much force it can withstand before cracking if you apply the pressure evenly all the way around. And then what you do, you can let it dry for a little bit if you want. Hold on, Weldon's getting wet. Okay, move. All right, so then you start looking. And we have several eggs. Cool. All right, so you squeeze it. It's still dripping everywhere, which is annoying, but you squeeze it. And then you start looking through the mop. So these eggs I'm not going to collect. I'll just put them back in. But if you see here, if your hands are clean, mine are pretty clean. I know I just touched the lizard, but well, I didn't touch him with this finger. Make sure that your fingers are pretty clean. You don't have lotion on them. You've rinsed them a um, lot. So you go in here. The eggs are often inside the mop. The males drive the females into the center of the mop. And you just pick it like that. And they're hard. The fertile ones are clear and you can see it's right there on my finger. Okay, so that's how you pick them, that's all. Some eggs are light sensitive. I've heard that um, blue galeris are. Um, hold, weld it. I'm gonna have to put him back in his tank. Okay, so some of these are light sensitive. That's why I keep the eggs in a drawer as well. Um, but yeah, that's just how you pick them. And again, they're very hard when they're fertile. So you do not have to be shy about squeezing the mop or handling the eggs, as long as your fingers are clean. So I'm going to put this back, actually. So because this is a plant spawner, 
okay, a plant slash mop spawner. You can work with the eggs two different ways. You can leave it in there. Um, this is called the permanent setup or the colony setup. So hopefully they don't eat the eggs, okay? Or you can put them in a shallow dish of water, also at room temperature, um, like a centimeter of water, and they will water incubate for about two weeks. So you can do that too, and then they will just hatch in the water. I've accidentally water incubated gar uh, eggs before, so. All right, see ya, Charlie. Thanks for coming by. Oh my gosh, it's already been an hour. Okay. I need to wrap up. Oh, sorry. Awkward angle. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to try and wrap, not wrap up. I will quicken the pace, okay? Does anyone have questions on picking eggs? <laughs> Brown one is, yeah, I know. It's my life. Fish in one hand, lizard in the other. Usually a pile of papers I need to grade. Okay, does anyone have any questions about picking eggs? Super easy. So far, so good. All right, let's go. So, every time I pick an egg, what I do is there's about a centimeter of peat in here. I boiled it. So I boil the peat. One, it helps sink, make it sink in the water column. Two, it sterilizes it. So I put it in a pot that I use for no other purpose other than to boil peat moss. And I boil it, it doesn't really matter, like I boil it for like 20 minutes just cause. And then um, I lay down like a centimeter of peat in here and obviously let it cool. So um, brine shrimps that are not as hard and they won't survive in fresh water and eat eggs. Yeah. Um, so I always add a tiny bit of salt in my water, and that seems to really help brine shrimp survive for quite a while. Uh, I've had brine shrimp survive like um, over 24 hours if the fish don't eat it. Uh, the jars behind me, the one gallon jars, they're too big. I can't fit that in my drawer. <laughs> this is the perfect size. Um, I have spawned a pair of killifish in one of those jars. So actually, the father, the original foundation male, is here. He's in, he likes being in a one gallon jar. Every time I try and put him in with his sons and daughters, he freaks out. Not freaks out, he just mopes a lot and hides a lot. But whenever he is in the jar, he like flares a lot at his neighbor. I have video of that. Will fingers contaminate the eggs? No, as long as your hands are clean. Do the eggs need to be handled with more care when they are eyed up? I'm not sure because they definitely don't touch them. <laughs> so, um, hold on. Okay, there he is. Um, I don't touch them. So I have the egg on my finger, right, like I showed you guys. I have my boiled peat, room temperature now. You want it damp. You want it so when you squeeze it, water will come out, okay? But only if you squeeze like medium hard. You don't want it any wetter than that. So I will have the egg on my finger, my fingertip, and then I'll just place it randomly on the peat. It doesn't matter because you're going to be hatching them all at the same time. I just try to not let two eggs touch because remember, whenever you have eggs on peat like this, it helps limit fungal infection traveling from one egg to another. So I just try to like not let them touch. If I see any eggs that are that fungusy cotton, I'll take um, like a pen or something and pick it out. They will also kind of like burst apart um, when you touch them, so you have to be really careful. The um, the fungus ones. Boil the peat in an ordinary saucepan. I don't know what kind of pan I got. I went to Target and got the cheapest, like the cheapest pot that I could. It was like 10 bucks. Um, so I just got the cheapest pot that I could. Um, my boyfriend does all the cooking, so I think he would be upset if I used one of his things. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, I just got a really cheap one. I don't know what kind of metal it is. 
Are some killies easier than others? Definitely. So killifish people love like, I like to think of it as kind of like Pokemon. They all have collectoritis and all of the killifish look different and all of them are different difficulty levels, I guess. And so what makes you a master killifish breeder is if you can handle those uh, really difficult to spawn species. And I do not have any, wow, my hair, um, I do not have any experience with those crazy hard fish. Um, I just, you know, hang out with them and they tell me stories and stuff like that. Like, um, if you're a master killifish breeder, you can figure out the key to how to spawn those fish. And some of them are like really protective of their secret. Some of them, not all of them. Uh, but yes, they definitely vary in difficulty. Actually, um, I'm not going to grab it now, but if you join the American Killifish Association, um, they send you like this be this beginner's guide if you're a first timer. And it's hilarious because like in the back page, it has a list of easy killifish, a list of intermediate killifish, and then a list of advanced killifish for only the most dedicated and passionate fish keepers. So they definitely vary. And what I am showing you is like easy to intermediate level. So um, I haven't, um, these are for this peat, this like um, vaporization method, I guess, is for easy to intermediate kind of fish. So I'm not sure what Golden Wonder is listed as. Um, actually, none of the Achilles keepers I know keep Golden Wonders. So, but if it's a plant spawner or a mop spawner or even a peat spawner, so another alternative method, what some people do is they put a bunch of peat on the bottom of the tank and then oh, and nothing else and then the fish spawn in the peat and then you can collect the peat and do the same thing. You just collect all the peat, dry it out, and then put it in a container. Um, so the Nathalebius, this is the very first annual that I'm doing. So some fish live for a while. Like um, I think that gardener eye is like three years old, two or three years old. Nathalebius, so this is an annual. Um, this one lives like maybe two years in captivity in the wild, it'll live like a year. And then their entire habitat dries up. And so they are deep peat spawners. You put like a big bowl of peat in their tank and then they dive and lay their eggs in the peat so that when their environment or their habitat dries up, then uh, the eggs can survive in there. They go into like this temporary developmental pause called diapause actually. And then, um, so these guys, you collect up the peat, you kind of dry it to that uh, consistency that I said before, like when you squeeze it, water should come out, uh, but not before that. And um, put them in your egg drawer. <laughs> killing people have their egg drawers. Killing people have killing fish closets and garages and stuff. Oh, Flynn, you can get killing fish. <laughs> Everyone should have killing fish. They're so cool. Okay, anyway, keep going on tangents. Okay. It's already been an hour. All right, all right. So you have your peat, okay? And then you take your egg, you put it in, make sure it's not touching any of the other eggs. What I do is I put the species, I keep a tally of, oh, I keep a tally of how many eggs have fungus away. So only one egg out of all of these fungus. Um, I put, so I got these on 1110, okay, from Sandy Binder. He's so nice. Um, I used to have three females in there. <laughs> and then uh, every day I counted how many eggs were laid. And if you're going to do this, I would collect eggs like every other day. And then from the last day, you want to count out between two and three weeks. And then that's your hatch date. That's your wet date. The incubation period for... Um, each killifish species varies. And that's why it's really important to uh, look up what the incubation period is for your fish, because it's gonna vary species to species. So anyway, that's how I do it. Okay. 
So D from Brooklyn, guess we can't hatch them up here in North and Jar since the rooms are cold. Um, so people that I know that live in colder areas, they usually heat up the entire room. So um, people say that that's cheaper than uh, individually heating up like a drawer or jars or stuff. So um, they usually heat up their entire fish room, which is a pretty serious endeavor. You know, it's a pretty serious commitment. Oh yeah, so the, what's this? I'm not allowed to be frivolous. What? Did Siri, I'm not talking to you. I really don't like this phone. Okay, so the temp of, um, again, will um, vary from species to species, but a great majority of eggs will be incubated around um, 70 degrees um, 70 degrees, yes. Yeah. My drawer is from like 68, 69 to 72. <laughs> Siri, I, I don't know. I changed the number too. Oh my goodness. Okay, Weldon's fallen asleep. Good. All right, so you have this. Okay, so the next part is you let it go for, um, you calculate the wet, the hatch date. And then you look in, and whenever you get to the hatch date, you start looking at your eggs. And you want to look for the eyed up egg. So I'm going to put that in again. And sometimes when you flash, put your flashlight on them, they'll move. And that's when you really know they're going to hatch. So here you go. Here again, you want to look for the eyes. They'll be twisting around in their eggs. Um, okay, so the next part is actually wetting them. So, I forgot to add that when I'm hatching, I actually keep this thing around. There will be like three or four rounds of hatching. I'm not okay, sure why. so not here is some exactly footage that time. I took a while ago. But for example, I did um, the initial hatch. Of so this, this thing is how much water ago, I put in. And I'm still there's a lot of different four or five fry morning uh, and afternoon. Oh. So is it keep it me that's talking, or is it the video that's that talking? When I'm hatching. I actually it's keep video this thing around. Talking. There will be like three or four rounds of okay. hatching. This not sure why not all of them hatch I, at exactly yeah. the same time. But for example, I did the initial hatch of this. Okay, it should just be me talking again. There we go. My alter ego. <laughs> uh, I don't have any brothers or sisters. Maybe it's my, oh wait, I have a half brother. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> I think I have a half brother. Okay, so the actual wetting process. So this is why I like these containers again. They fit in the drawer easily. They're easy to work with and you can hatch in them too. So I just take aged aquarium water um, from whatever tub I'm going to put them in. And then I um, fill it up about an inch, inch and a half. Um, Killy keepers uh, will say that the pressure matters, like how much water depth there is, that uh, a little bit more water depth is actually a little better. Others will only wet it to like a centimeter. I'm not sure what is best. It's kind of your kind of experimentation. It's probably species to species too. So you fill it in with aged aquarium water, and then you just let it sit. And then the magic happens, like, it's really quite magical. Okay. Um, oh, quick, quick, first, you have to have a place where you're going to put your fry. Okay, so before you add water, you should have a tank that you're going to put your fry in. Okay, so here is a tank that I'm going to use tomorrow. Oh, oh my gosh. What happened? Oh. Okay. Hold on. All right, so here's a tank that I'm going to put fry in. These are, um, this is like my mini fry rack. I have, these are three gallon tubs from Ikea. They were like three bucks. They're so cool. Anyway, so this is what my fry tub looks like. Um, and a bunch of killy keepers do this too. So what I've done 
is in the top corner I drilled the exact um, diameter of the airline tubing. And if you look in here, if you look in the back, you see that gang valve? So it's, um, there's four little things and it splits off from my central air pump, okay? And each one of those air tube line things goes to, um, goes in each lid. So here in the back, okay? I also added just a, another heat mat in there. I don't have it running the length of the um, tub because I don't want it to be 80 degrees. It's calibrated to 80 degrees for my other tanks. I want these guys to be um, just warmer because this is the very bottom row. It gets colder than the rest of the room. Normally it's at 68. So I want it to be back up at like 71, 72, possibly a little warmer than that because these are fry. So let's see. Yeah, super great deal, D. I love good deals. <laughs> Man, being in the Philippines was awesome because I'm not normally like a shoe person, but I got brand new Keds for like six bucks. <laughs> and we got like $7 massages, like legit massages. And um, what else? I got some really nice Hush Puppy heels for um, $20, I think. Like an aerosol. Oh, it was crazy. Okay, side note. Philippines is like... 10 times cheaper than the US. Okay, so each one of those airline tubes, okay, goes in. I have these really cool little filters that my friend brought back from Taiwan. So you can see it's got like, it's just a tiny little sponge filter and I like that it angles forward like that. And then it just goes here. This is another like sponge filter thingy and some, I'll put an air stone in it. Okay, so you can do that. Just a tiny filter that fits in there is great. Air movement, some filtration. Got water, I prime and salt the water. So what can go in here? So your fry will appreciate cover, they will appreciate food, um, and the things that you put in here uh, can help her can help it, right? So um, these sponge filters have been seeding in another tank. So they're all um, cycled and ready to go. They probably have infusoria on them, microorganisms that they can also feed on. Uh, you can put in a spawn mop. This is actually from Aquarium Co-op. <laughs> this is like the first year that Corey opened his store because my family in Seattle um, used to be right next to him, so. Let's see, this is like an old, old mop. <laughs> um, mops, if you've used them for other fish, you know what I'm gonna say, bleach and boil them. Like uh, this thing has been bleached and boiled so many times and rinsed, bleach boiled and rinsed. And then, uh, so you can add a spawn mop to make it sink, you just kind of squeeze it under the water. Now, if I wanted to add plants from one of my other tanks, which tank am I going to take it from? Okay, so let's see. I have a lot of java moss, java fern, a lot of plants here. Am I going to take it from the gardener eye killifish, my gold gardener eye tank? Am I going to take it from my rayfield gardener eye tank, from my beta rubra tank, or from this tank that just has a bristlenose placostomus that's growing out. I'm probably gonna take it from this tank. The danger with taking it from, pla from, uh, from taking plants from fish that do uh, plant or mop spawn, there's gonna be eggs in it, okay? And unlike a um, spawning mop, you can't bleach or boil it, okay? So even if you took a lot of time and you thought you picked out all of the eggs, there is still a possibility that there would be gardener eye gold eggs. See, aren't they pretty? Um, <laughs> that there would be gardener eye gold eggs in here. And what if I'm hatching out Rayfield eggs? Like that would be terrible. So um, 
I would pick plants from an established tank that doesn't have uh, mop spawners, especially from um, a tank where it could potentially hybridize or crossbreed with whatever fry you're hatching out. So you do not want to do that. And then I like to add driftwood too. Driftwood like fosters the growth of tons of microorganisms and I just really like the look of driftwood. Okay, old school, should you use old tank water? Um, gosh, how often do I do water changes? Uh, <laughs> like every two weeks or so, two or three weeks. Um, my tanks are really low tech and lightly stocked. So um, I, I call that aged. I don't know how aged aged it is. Um, this is actually fresh water. I age it aged it for like a day so uh chola wood russell i don't use chola wood um it looks cool let's see enrique beautiful way to spend the last day official of the year oh thanks okay uh let's see okay hello from sweden melina okay um Hey, look, the puffer fish is out. So cute. Actually, I haven't fed him yet. Because he was hiding. I guess. Oh, ow, 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 ow. This laptop is really hot. Okay. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, I know he's so excited. No, come back. Come back. Come on. It's over here. There he goes. Nope. He wants a snail. It's down here. You little... It's over here. There he goes. Anyway, that's my puffer fish. Uh, you know what, Flynn? That is my goal. The teacher of the year last year, like the national teacher of the year, basically had a reptile zoo and in her classroom. So, And then I actually wrote out a lesson plan for breeding fish that I think would be really good for genetics. Okay. It's a red eye, red belly puffer fish. Completely freshwater. Apparently very difficult to find. So... Uh, he came in with a shipment of Fajaca puffers on accident. Okay, let's see. So, I have the thing. All right, so let me just flip back to this. You have your... Okay, so you have your thing, and you filled it up with water. What do you do next? You wait. And most of the time, you don't have to wait long. Okay, so here's a video... Let me change the audio. So here's a video of the last time I hatched stuff. I'm sorry, I forgot to change the audio input. Wildcast, Wirecast is really confusing. Okay, so what I was just saying that you all didn't hear is um, this doesn't take very long. So you add the water and you just wait. And the babies start um, hatching out in about 10, 20, 30 minutes. 
and it's pretty amazing. So the little squiggly things are baby brine shrimp. Old timers say you should add a little bit of baby brine shrimp or even a little bit of decaying matter uh, for infusoria, some kind of food source for the fry as soon as they come out. They can't swim all that well. As soon as they hatch, you can see um, they're just kind of bobbing around. But give them an hour or two and they'll be swimming near the surface of the water like regular fry. And again, it doesn't matter where in the substrate they hatch from. The, that little guy hatched at the bottom and he's fighting his way towards the top. So it happens extremely, extremely quickly. So the next thing that you do is, um, I didn't have a video of it, but so pretend, let me, let me come back to the camera. Okay, so say you have this and you have water up to here and you wait like an hour or two and then there are fry they kind of swim underneath the surface of the water because uh, most killifish are surface feeders, so that's where they like to congregate, right? So all you have to do is open it up, okay? And then I would go over to my tub and then just pour it gently. I'm actually, I'm not gonna do it obviously, but I'm, I would pour the top of the water that contains all the baby fry into here. And then all I have to do is re-add more water back into this tub. And I keep this going for two or three days. And um, all the eggs that are gonna hatch usually hatch within two or three days. So again, all the fry will be at the top. All you have to do is kind of pour them in gently. The peat moss, because you boiled it, hopefully, <laughs> will stay at the bottom. So all you, you just, it's called, um, What's the fancy word when I used to work in a lab? Decanting. You decant off the liquid from your precipitate. <laughs> and then you, um, uh, you refill it again with more tank water. And then you let it sit. And I usually check it night and morning for um, two or three days. Now, if it's a species that you really, really want. So I've been collecting this... So in this particular one, I started collecting 11, 16, and I stopped collecting 12, 9, and I got 60 eggs. Say the hatch rate is 50%. I would be happy with 30 fry. It's probably going to be more than that because um, I've been picking out the infertile eggs and stuff. I am totally happy. The Rayfield, I think I have like 45 of them. That's way too many. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you can never have enough, right? But... Um, but if it's, and you might be fine with that. It's called first wedding. However, if it's a species that you really, really, really want, um, you have the option of pouring off all the water, like kind of squeezing and drying the peat again, and then putting it back in storage for two or three weeks. And then you can re-wet again. Like some of the guys in the club work with super, super rare fish, and they will re-wet the same peat for up to a year so that they can get every single last egg that they can to hatch. Let's see. Okay, last thing about hatching. Sometimes you see eggs that are eyed up and they're even wiggling, but for some reason they've gone past a stage where they can't break out of the egg anymore. So one trick that I've used that works really well actually is you take a film canister like one of the old black film canisters and you put a little tank water in there. You put the eggs in there. You breathe CO2 into the canister so it's kind of like hyperventilating right? Like, <laughs> like get as much CO2 in there as you can. Snap the lid on. Put it in your pocket. Then you just walk around, go about your day for an hour. And for some reason, there's something about the CO2, maybe it's acidifying the water or something, um, and the warmth from your body and the motion from walking around and doing your stuff forces eggs to hatch. Um, so that can work if you have stubborn eggs too. So let's see, let's stop for questions. V-Stag, your stream with Bob last night was great. Oh man, that was so funny. I didn't know you guys were watching me. 
<laughs> the audio was a little weird, but uh, that was super fun. Hey, Jamie. Thanks for dropping by. Okay, can I feed micro in a tank with substrate? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't have a ton of experience with microworms, but um, I just feel like they would get stuck in the substrate, right? That, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you can. Maybe someone who is more experienced with microworms should answer that question. Okay, some, some in-chat talk would be great. Uh, yeah, Tamara, microworm sink. That would be my, my problem, too. Or I think that would be the problem, too. Russell, this makes me feel more comfortable trying to raise some. Yeah, it's a, it was great to hang out with killifish keepers for like a year before I started trying to work things out. So let's see. I'm glad that this stream helps you too. Okay, I'm, uh, let's see. Yeah, right, D, stretching the hatch. It's crazy. Oh, lithosa. I used to throw in an oxygen tablet for Nothobranchius for I less belly sliders. Yeah, I've really heard of that. Um, I haven't had a ton of belly sliders, but then I haven't been breeding a lot of um, a ton of killifish. I mean, I've been keeping them for like two or three years now, but still. And I've never kept Nothos. And I think I've only had one or two belly sliders. Uh, I was reading about why they belly slide. So... Um, yeah, an oxygen tablet would be really cool to try out if you're having belly slider problems. Bettas, when they belly slide, that has to do with the development of their swim bladder. I have no idea how the development of a swim bladder in a killifish works. Let's see. All right, and then, so you hatched your fish. You got as many as you could. And, um... According to the species, they might have different temperature requirements. For example, Nathalevius likes um, warmer temperatures. Uh, most killifish, the thing I love about them is most of them do fine at room temp, um, which is huge contrast to bettas, which like to be um, heated. But you just raise them like normal fry. And... Um, what do I feed them? I feed them grindle worms. So you guys can look in my other videos, but I have a video um, on how to feed grindle worms. And um, you can separate out the grindles by size. And then you can pick the smallest grindle worms and feed those to the youngest fry. But honestly, they're quite large. So those fry over there, the Rayfield fry, I put them in there like a week, so they're like three weeks. How old are they? So, 10, 10, 11. Okay, they're like four or five weeks old, so. No, no, they're four weeks old and they're already that large. They're four weeks old, they're already like this big and sexing out. So, because I, I had the hatch date as 10, 26, but I actually didn't get around to hatching them for a long time. So um, I should have written down the actual hatch date. They are four weeks old, so they grow really fast. So I feed them grindle worms. I move them on to pellets pretty quick after that. Uh, let's see. So I guess um, maybe keep the question centered around killifish and hatching killifish. Um, I will do a live stream on bettas at some point, although this my life is about to get he hectic with the semester starting on Tuesday. But, you know, I'd like to do this. We'll see. Maybe Sundays. It's just Saturday is like my um, fish day. Saturday is the day that I'm in here and tooling around and stuff because Sunday I'm trying to get all the stuff I should have done on Saturday done. So, but we'll see. Okay, I will answer. So Dylan, um, let's see. I'm breeding bettas and I have infusoria culturing. Can I use frozen BBS instead of live? Um, I really wouldn't go with frozen. They just, I fry really, especially bettas, really like live food. And it's actually not that hard to do it. 
uh, once you get the hang of it, hatching brine shrimp isn't that hard. So um, I really would try to put in, I, I, I really would use live food. So again, I had, when I was very starting, um, I tried to uh, raise seven spawns of bettas without using live VBS because I thought it was too hard. And it just ended up in a lot of pain and only one survived out of all those seven, so. Uh, you can feed micro, but you will need to siphon more often. Yeah, they tend to die on the bottom. Try not to overfeed. Uh, Tamara, I'm dealing with a couple sick fish. Um, what kind of sickness? I'm not the best at sickness. That might be a good one to ask, like, Lucas or Quarry or Bob. Um, that might be a good one. Because I don't, I deal with a very limited range of fish, right? I feel like they would know a lot more uh, than I do about other kinds of fish. Brown Wenism. What is the pH of your water or what pH do you recommend? So it depends on the species. So those licorice gouramis, um, they are pure RO or rainwater. And um, that combined with the Indian almond leaf, they are their pH is past four, lower than four. It's like three or four. And they need that to survive. Um, also really, really low TDS. Their total dissolved solid requirement has to be like below 100. Um, they're a lot like other betta species, like betta bertigala, like those things from blackwater habitats. They need really low pH. For killifish, sorry, that's probably what you were asking about. Killifish are, again, it depends on the species, but most of them are neutral, like pH 7. I bet whatever comes out of the tap is fine for most killifish. Dwayne, hey Dwayne. Thanks. Tuber challenge was super fun. Thanks for nominating me. That was, that was really fun. Um, it made me think a lot. <laughs> Let's see. What temperature are killifish comfortable at? Depends. Most of them are just fine at room temperature. Like out of all the killifish rooms that I visited, and I have a couple in the fish room tours, um, almost all of them were at room temp, which for them did vary between like up like low 70s to um, Jim the Notho guy. His garage gets up to like 90 in the summer because he keeps his fish out in the garage. But my fish are happy in here. It swings from 70 to 73, 74 on a hot day. Um, but I would double check the species. Let's see. Oh boy. Wow. The chat. Ah. JC's tanks, I freeze my own BBS and condiment cups. Cool. Yeah, I've thought about doing that. That that would be really neat. My fish, like my adult fish, really don't like BBS. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, yes, diap, yeah, lithosa. Yes, depends on the species. Like I said, most room temperature diapterons, um, they joke that like Georgiae and um, cyanostictum and stuff, those, so the diapterons, they come from really, really high altitude, cold mountain streams. And uh, they do best at like 65, 67, 68. Everyone keeps telling me to keep them because I live like by the ocean in San Francisco where it's quite cold. Um, but honestly, I went around my apartment with the temperature gun trying to find a place to keep them. And even my apartment, living in the outer sunset where it's foggy and cold all the time, doesn't stay cold enough. <laughs> and then um, a lot of the other killy keepers that have done really well with them keep them in their garage. It's funny, they say to like keep them in the back of your closet where it's cold and dark because they don't like a lot of light. <laughs> They're beautiful. I almost got tempted by cyanostictum at the last meeting. I almost brought them home, but I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't devote the um, requirements that they needed. What's the average lifespan of a killifish southern fish keeper? Um, again, depends on the species. There are annuals. Those um, 
grow incredibly fast. Like some Nothobranchius only live three months because in the wild, they're, um, they live in shallow pools. It's amazing. The eggs uh, hatch and then they just go through this extremely rapid growth rate and then they, um, you know, they spawn and die. And then for the other nine months of the year, they're eggs. So um, that's one extreme end. Most um, like plant spawners, I think, uh, can live longer. Like my blue Galeris was three and a half. And um, the guys in my club were saying that was a pretty good age for a killifish. Tamara, I use a hatchery from brine shrimp direct. Yes, that's what I use. I just made the cardboard monstrosity to like cover up the light. I should like paint it or something, make it look nice. Um, let's see. Uh, so many to choose from. How do you decide? Um, you go to a meeting and then you talk to people and then you say you're going to leave with one pair and then you don't, you leave with more. I like, I actually really love fish auctions because it's like a super huge exercise of avoid, you know, of um, avoiding temptation. <laughs> so I'm the kind of person who's, you know, somewhat frugal and cheap. So it's like whenever I overcome wanting something that badly, and then I get away and I'm like, phew, I didn't get it. I actually feel better than if I actually bought it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I pick the ones that I like at auctions. Um, or I go on Aquabid. Uh, let's see. Thank you for the introduction of killifish. Yeah, I, I didn't know much about them either, Jamie. So it's been a really quite a nice world to get into it. Okay, Giselle, has anyone asked you how you have been? How am I feeling? Uh, I got something stuck in my throat last night. That was really weird. It's like, so whenever you swallow food, you have that um, peristalsis in your throat, which, um, I mean, that's how food is conveyed from your mouth to your stomach, right? It just, all the muscles involuntarily squeeze the food down. And I feel like mine didn't do that. I had like a piece of food or something stuck in my throat. But anyway, that aside, I'm okay. I got, it went away after a while. Okay. Sebastian, you should try diapterons. Like everyone has trouble with diapterons, but they're called jewels for a reason. So you should look up diapteron uh, cyanostictum. So here, cyanostictum. Like seriously, you should check them out. Okay. Eh. Got homemade hatchery with the nipple adapter for an air hose. Sweet. That sounds like fun. I love DIY stuff. Does Jim have his own channel? Oh, I'm not sure. It's snowing. I wish it was snowing. You make me want to go back to Seattle. I do miss home a lot. Because, like, you're, it sounds like you're really close to where my family is uh, in Edmonds. So, which is where Corey's store is. Okay, D, bye. Have fun. I need to go do work as well. Um, how about 50 degrees or below? 50's pushing it. 50 is getting really cold for most fish. I uh, wouldn't try that. Um, Cap, Cap Lopez eggs? That would be cool. See, y'all have so much expertise and so many things. So I love it whenever you guys share it in the chat box because I learn a lot too. Um, so thank you, Mr. Super 101. So Giselle, nice. Congratulations on the job. Congratulations. Having a job is awesome. I need a job. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brown Wenism. What killy species do you recommend for a killy novice? or novice, however you pronounce it, uh, definitely gardener eye. They're like the guppies of the killifish world. They're awesome, beautiful, colorful, hardy. They get, you know, a good size. Like my male is like this big, but it's not too big. Like the biggest male is in his own one gallon jar and he's fine. So 
Um, and then I have a trio and a 10 gallon and they're fine. So, um, sweet. Okay. I am saying it right. <laughs> Tamara. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Oh boy. Jamie Hansen, fish are like potato chips. They really are. Like I, uh, I didn't anticipate one how much fun hobby the hobby would be and two how out of control it would get and three the community the community is a really great hobby it like appeals to my introvertedness <laughs> my introversion um to stay like to stay at home and tinker and experiment with things and then to like share out with you guys and learn about what you guys do and then go to um aquarium hobbies uh clubs and stuff like that so aquabid any good in europe um i see like global stuff actually um i see quite a bit of fish killifish available from like glasgow glasgow i'm probably saying it wrong i'm so sorry scotland um from uh from a user called strathclyde i guess so if you look on Aquabid and right next to it, it has a little like earth sign, like a global s globe sign, you'll see it whatever you look. That means that it's probably in Europe or elsewhere in the world. Sub-zero weather. Okay. Okay. Striatum, yeah, we have striatum in the club. They're awesome. Do you ever sell killifish eggs? Yeah, they're really pretty too. Uh, Southern Fish Keeper, do you ever sell killifish eggs? Um, I have not before, but I might try. Like, I think it seems really easy to send them in the mail. And I've sent tons of fish in the mail. And um, they usually, or they do fine. But then bettas are really hardy. Although I've sent killifish too. Anyway, sorry. Um... Yeah, I might try it. I think that the conservation effort um, would make it worth it. So, um, yes, Jamie, definitely join your local aquarium club. Most aquarium clubs are like awesome people. Okay, so I am going to wrap this up. I cannot believe how easy it is for these things to get out of hand. I was only going to do this for an hour. <laughs> But at least it's recorded. So if y'all need anything, you can just go back to this and, um, you know, rewatch it if you're look, um, looking into hatching your own eggs. So, um, Russell, last thing. So most of the pics I have seen have either been red, blue, some yellow. I've seen a pic, don't know the name of it, that was lime green. Oh boy. There are gazillions of killifish species. <laughs> oh man, um, I have no idea. <laughs> there are um, actually, just a side note, so there's this book. There are books devoted to um, all the killifish species, right? And there's this gorgeous book that I wanted so badly. Um, it's called Killifish Species of the Old World. And it was like, it's this thick. And every page has like eight beautiful photographs of each different species and stuff. And I found out that uh, for my birthday in November, my boyfriend was trying to get this specific book. There were like really, really limited copies of it in the world. And he collaborated with one of my friends. Yeah, it's the Aqualog. And um, it was it the Aqualog. I can't remember. It was like an old one. But anyway, um, one of my killifish friends told him about it and they collaborated and worked it all out and he was gonna make it a huge surprise for me and then it got lost in the mail so we never found it which was sad I think he was like really upset and I hope it doesn't discourage him from buying more fish books for me <laughs> so anyway will I live stream more Flynn maybe if I have more time this is fun but it does take a lot of time. Um, 
and I really do love interacting with all of you. This is cool because it forces me to cover things that I don't normally cover in my videos, which is really fun. So maybe like once a month, once every two weeks, maybe I'll just start live streaming anytime. So um, anyway. Oh, the J. Shiel, uh, Ronald Lass. Yes, I have. Um, I have another. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. J. Shiel book that I got at the last auction too somewhere. Um, it's on my bookshelf somewhere. Uh, Giselle, um, what were you saying? Oh, Brownwinism. Nice. Teachers unite. <laughs> I have to say, I love teaching. It's like the best profession ever. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Oh, hold on. Okay, Giselle, I will get my bearded dragon, naming it after your Weldon. <laughs> That'll be awesome. They're great, great pets. Um, yeah, bearded dragons are just great. They're like cats in reptile form. <laughs> so... Anyway, guys, thank you all for being here. That was super fun. Just, I don't know, I was just tooling around in the fish room on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, that was super fun. Okay, I'm not sure how to sign off, like, nicely. <laughs> Some people have, like, a tagline, right? Know how to hello 